Many of the lessons I learned about being a pastor and about leadership didn't happen in a classroom setting. They happened in places like this. This is Kannapolis First Wesleyan Church. This is the church that I grew up in. Tina and I dated while we were going to church here. And we were married right down there on that stage. But what I want to tell you about is I want to tell you about my grandpa Freeman. My grandpa Freeman would sit, oh, about four or five rows from the front down there right on the aisle. Him and grandma would worship in this church. And I remember right up until, right up until the end of his life, he would still come in here and he would worship. And I got to tell you, it was an amazing thing to learn how deeply a man could worship his God his entire life. Just before Tina and I went to the Sandy Ridge Wesleyan Church in Hickory, North Carolina, we had been called to be the pastoral couple there, but just before going, we went over to Grandpa's house to have him pray over us. So when I told him what we were doing and that we were going to Hickory to, to serve there as a pastor, he, he said this to me. He said, Michael, when you get up there at that church, you just love and take care of those people and they will love and take care of you. Folks, I gotta tell you, since that day, I have sat under the teaching of some of the best leadership instructors in the country, but I have never gotten better advice. Grandpa was right. His advice was better than about any leadership lesson I could have gotten. I've learned over the years that if you wanna speak life into someone else, the number one thing you must do is you must love them. Because listen to me, if you will love and take care of them, they will love and take care of you. Well, hey, y'all, how you doing? Good. All right, all right. Now, we're, we're coming down to the end of this series on Speak Life. And, and today what we want to deal with is we want to process this last point, which is speak love. Now, I, I, I got to tell you, though this is the last point that we're going to do in this series, and it's actually the last chapter in the book, I need you to know that it's actually the basis upon which you'll be able to do anything with the book or you'll be able to do anything with speaking life in your life. I, I, I need you to understand that, that speaking life requires that you know how to love people. Now, I'm going to say a few things that maybe you'll agree with, maybe you won't, but, but let's process them. And, and if you disagree with something I'm about to say, here's what I'd ask you to do. I want you to consider what I'm about to say. I want you to hold it for just a little bit and, and, and just ask yourself the question, what if he's right? Just what if he's right? You just wrestle with it, all right? Because you don't have to always agree with me, but at least wrestle with what I'm going to throw out there because it'll make your thinking stronger, if you will, okay? Now, first point you may or may not agree with, but I'm going to tell you it's true. You cannot speak life into somebody that you do not, to some degree, have a love for. You cannot speak life into somebody that you do not have a love for. If you don't love people, you can't, by nature, speak life into them. For instance, for instance, it, it, these are the sermon titles we've just been through. But think, if you don't love somebody, you can't really speak value into them because you don't value them. Now, I'm not talking about, you know, I'm not saying you got to love everybody the same. That doesn't exist. But there's a love you have for people that's got to exist or you won't really see value in them. And if you don't see value in them, you can't speak value into them. You can't speak life into them. If you don't truly love somebody, you're not going to be able to speak beauty into them because you're not going to see beauty in them. It's your love that, give, that, that, that shows you the beauty in people's lives. If you don't truly love somebody, you can't speak vision into their lives because you don't see vision for them. All you see is just what in front of, what's in front of you. You don't take the time to consider what could be or what might be. So you're not going to speak vision into someone you don't have love for. You are not going to speak ability into someone you have a love for. In fact, if you don't have love for someone, you can't speak ability into their life. You actually are going to add a disability in their life because you are unable to love them. That love will actually disable their lives if, it's, if you're not careful. Finally, you're never, ever, ever going to be able to speak trust into the life of someone you don't love. Because if you don't love them, you don't have a trust for them. And if you don't trust them, you can't speak 
trust into them. Quite frankly, you cannot speak life into someone that you can't, on some level, learn how to love. You've got to understand that. This is the very basis. It's the fulcrum on which the whole thing tilts. Now, let me say something further. Maybe controversial. Maybe you'll agree with it. Maybe you want. I believe this is true. You cannot effectively lead someone that you do not at some level love. You can't lead people without loving them. If you try to lead people without loving them, what you are actually going to do is manipulate and use them. Because if you don't love them, they cease to be human beings and they become human resources. And I need you to understand, it's not healthy for us as Christian men and women to have human resources. It's healthy for us to have around us human beings. Because Jesus did not shed his blood for human resources. Jesus shed his blood for human beings. And anytime we give a title like that, that takes the personality, the individuality, that takes the actual person out of the human, we fail to love them and we fail to speak value into them because listen, you don't have value because you are a resource. You have value because you are a being. Does that make sense? So what we've got to do is we've got to learn to love people. And I don't think you can even lead people that you don't love. I honestly believe this. I know that a lot of you will disagree with me. You'll say, well, I lead people at work, and I don't love the people at work. I don't even really like the people at work. I have to lead them. But you have to have a love for them. You have to have a concern for them. You have to, on some level, care about them, or you're not going to lead them appropriately. i got to tell you something else. Unless you know how to love, you can't be like God. Unless you know how to love, you can't be godly. Let me pause. You said, Pastor, I like your sermon and all. It would make a really good song. But, 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 Pastor... I'm not sure I understand the value of what you're saying. Well, I tell you what, let me let Peter give some value to what I'm saying. The apostle Peter, you remember him? St. Peter, the one that actually was the first leader of the church, establishes, founds the church, makes sure the church survives the first century. That Peter, the one that walked with Jesus, that Peter, he had something to say about this. It's in 1 Peter chapter 4, and it's verse 8. Now, let, let me tell you what he says. Uh, this is not where the sermon's going to come. We're going to be at First John for the sermon. But I want to give you this. I want you to have this. I want you to see this. He says in 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 8, he says, above all else. Now, hold up. Time out. Time out. Time out. Listen to what he says. Above all else. You hearing him? Above all else. Above all your money. You got it? Above all your stuff. Got it? Above all of your titles, above all of your positions, above all of your accomplishments, above all of your trophies, above all of your friends, above all of your power, above all of your all of your popularity, above all of your (laughs) you're gonna get mad at me. Above all of your spirituality. Above all else. Love each other. You hear that? The founder of the church said above all else, love each other. The guy who first showed us how to do church said above all else, love each other. Above everything, love each other. He didn't say above all else, lead efficiently. He didn't say above all else, sing out of the hymnal. He didn't say above all else, get in a building and build a building. He didn't say any of that. He said above all else, 
love each other. Why would he say that? Yeah, he's going to answer it. Because love covers a multitude of sins. What a great line. What a great reality. See, some of y'all are going, well, I don't understand why that's a big deal. Well, uh, the preacher loves you, it's going to be all right. Because we all have an abundance of sins that we need something to cover over. Can I get an amen? Look at your neighbor and say, he's talking to me, not you. Go ahead, John. Go ahead. Go ahead. You know. Hmm. <laughs> now listen, listen, listen. The truth is that love is what holds us together. You say, what do you mean love covers a multitude of sins? I got one word. For, well, let me give you two words for that. You ready? Your children. Anybody got that one? Love covers a multitude. Because you can look at your children and know what they've done and still go, oh. That's how God loves us. That's how God sees us. Even after all the pain, even after all the hurt, even after all of the rebellion, he still looks at us and says, I love you so much. I might not like what you've just done but I'll chase you every day of your life. You see that? Love covers a mult above all. Church, listen to me. If I could say anything that would help the church change the world, it would probably be this line. Above all else, love each other. For love covers a multitude of sins. Say, okay, pastor, this sounds like one of those sticky, sweet sermons. I'm going to gain a few pounds. Um, can you tell me why this is efficient or how I should get there? I can do that. I can do that. And I want to do that, but with the help of St. John. So if you'll turn to 1 John. Now, if you're wondering where 1 John is, let me show you where 1 John is. Just go to the back of the book. All right, it's all the way in the back. Okay, 1 John. All the way in the back, 1 John. We're going to be in chapter 4 of 1 John. So 1 John chapter 4, and I, and I want us to start reading here. We're, we're going to be in verse 7, and what I want to do is I want to take these verses one piece at a time because I, I, I want you to catch some things. I want to show you four things that you've got to know about love, four things that if you don't catch about love, you're not going to be able to understand it, four things that if you don't know about love, you're never going to be able to actually love the people around you in the way that God loves you. Four things that will help you understand why love is important, okay? So I want us to walk through this. And along the way, I want to tell you some stories, and I want to give you some philosophy to help you understand why this is important to apply in your life, okay? So here's what we're going to do. Okay, 1 John chapter 4, verse 7. It starts out saying these words. Dear friends, let us love one another. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Okay, well, I want to say it again. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. I need you to first and foremost know and understand that love, rightly understood, comes from God. Love, rightly understood, comes from God. Now, now let, me, let me explain what I'm saying. Love, rightly understood. Now, listen to me, listen to me. The world defines love for us, but they define it poorly. The world actually defines love in a destructive way, quite frankly. I, I really don't mean to pick on anybody, so I, I don't want you to get the feeling I'm picking on folks, okay? But when the world defines love for us, the definition the world gives us of love is not something that necessarily builds us up. When the world says something about love, the world often gives us a definition that tears us down. They will say that love is something you make. I disagree. Love is not something you make. Love is something you choose. Love is a choice you make. Now, some of y'all are going, I don't think I like that preacher. That doesn't sound nearly romantical. Well, no, 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 listen to me. I, I, okay, okay, listen, listen, listen. I don't mean to steal the romance out of your life, okay? And I don't mean to freak anybody out, okay? There is no such thing as love at first sight. 
Okay, the Disney movies where they meet at a dance and they get married the next day, not a good idea. Just saying. All right? I mean, I mean not really, really. There's a oh, preacher. I fell in love with her the first day I saw her. Well, you felt something, but it wasn't love. Did you know that? Love is not, see, now I'm going to freak you out. Mm. Okay, look, look, look at your neighbor and say, it'll be all right. Look at me, it'll be all right. It'll be all right. It'll be all right. It, it, tr- trust me. Tr- listen, listen, y'all, y'all, listen. Love's not a feeling. It's not. It's not. Love's not a feeling. Love is a choice of the will. I choose to love. Now don't get me wrong. Don't even get me wrong. That choice comes with some feelings. Thank God for the feelings, okay? Look at your neighbor, look at your spouse, and say, thank God for the feeling. All right, amen, everybody, all right? So I'm not here to to, to take all the fun out of the thing, but love is a choice of the will, because sometimes you have to love people when you don't feel it. Oh no, preacher, I feel it. Yeah, not all the time. You love your children. Amen? Amen. But there are moments. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about? Those moments. When you understand why wild animals eat their... I mean, no, 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 that, that, not that one. Not that moment. Not that moment. You know, you love your children, but there are moments. You love your spouse. But there are days... Some of y'all are sitting next to your spouse going, oh, no, baby, there ain't never been a day. (laughs) Yeah, right. And they're looking at you going, right. (laughs) Look, some of you just needed to be warned that marriage comes with morning breath. And you didn't know, you know. Listen, the truth is, the truth is, love is not a feeling because when you love people you choose to love them regardless of how you feel this is what i mean when i say the world has misdefined love they the world has given us a destructive view of love therefore people come to us in counseling and they'll say things well i like i just don't love him anymore you know what they're saying well i don't feel anything anymore well, well, you, well, well, make a choice. Because if you make a choice, feelings come and go. Choices don't. Let me tell you something. I'm not secure in my marriage because I know my wife will always feel like she loves me. I'm secure in my marriage because I know my wife will always choose me. You hear what I'm saying? And if you give me a choice, I'm going to take choose because feelings come and go. No, it shouldn't be that way. Wake up and smell reality. Love is a choice. And you've got to make it a choice. Look. Do you suppose when mankind rebels against God, he feels like loving us? Do you suppose when we reject him, he feels like loving us? Do you suppose that as mankind drove nails through the limbs of the Son of God, God felt like loving us? But he chose to. He chose to regardless of how he felt. If you base your life on feelings, you will live an entirely unstable existence. But if you base your life on godly choices, you will live a stable existence. You need to know that. And listen, I'm not trying to take the romance out of it. Don't anybody get mad at me. The romance is there and it's real, thank God. But it's a choice in the beginning. At its core, it's a choice. And you need to know that. Because God chose to love us. Love rightly understood 
comes from God. The writer goes on. John goes on. He says this. Uh, li listen to these words. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Listen to it again. Everyone who loves comes from God, I mean, has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Second thing I need you to know. Love rightly expressed... Love, rightly expressed, identifies God's people. Love, rightly expressed, identifies God's people. And let me, let me finish something I started earlier. I, I want you to hear this. If God is love, then if you don't know how to love, or you don't show love, then if you don't show love, you cannot be like God. Everybody's got that? Because God is love. If you don't show love, you cannot be godly. Does that make sense? If you don't show love, you cannot be like Jesus, right? If you don't show love, you cannot be Christ-like. See, now here's where it's going to hurt, so stay with me. If you don't show love, you cannot be Christian. Because God is love. Jesus is the perfect expression of that love. And if we can't love, we can't be Christian. Y'all listen to me. This is why the world has such a hard time believing anything the church has to say. Quite frankly, the world struggles with believing anything we have to say because we keep talking about a God that loves and acting like a devil that doesn't. I mean, I could tell you, I've been around churches uh, virtually my entire life at this point. I can tell you that Tina and I have been in churches where, where everybody in the church was mad at each other. I remember one church, there were seats on this side and seats on this side. Every time there was a church vote on anything, the yeses sat here and the noes sat there. And you know what I began to notice? On Sunday morning, the same folks sat in the same place. They were mad at each other all the time. This church had a history of fights in the parking lot after a business meeting. Where's Jesus in that? Can I just be blown with you? That church should not be blessed with the pastor. That church should be shut down. Because it's not Christian. Because they're not showing love. I'm not saying they have to agree all the time. Everybody look at your neighbor and say, you don't have to agree to love somebody. You don't have to always agree, all right? If you've ever been married or you've ever loved anybody, a spouse, a sibling, you know that you can love somebody and still disagree. Everybody's got that? Man, you got to show love. And when the people of God don't show love, the world looks at us and can't figure out who we are. I know of churches where people sue one another in the church all the time. There's no sense in that. There's no sense in that. Well, you won't let me teach that Sunday school class, so I'm going to file a lawsuit. Really? You can teach the class. It's going to be held down the road. We'll fix that. I mean, you see what I'm saying? And quite frankly, when there are churches that run around holding up hateful signs, that's not the love of Christ. And there's nothing Christian about it. Love, rightly expressed, identifies God's people. But look, he keeps going. He keeps going. Verse 9. Verse 9 reads like this. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. Verse 10. This is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son 
to be an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Love rightly understood comes from God. Love rightly expressed identifies God's people. But love rightly defined is found in Jesus. Look at it. Look at Jesus for just a minute. Look at what he did. Listen, listen to the words. Listen to the words. He sent his one and only son to be an atoning sacrifice for us. Can I give you these words from another place, from another writer? Paul says it this way, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were yet enemies of God, he sent his son to die on a cross for us. He did not, listen, listen, this is important. He did not wait for us to get good to send us Jesus. He sent Jesus so that we might have a pathway to get good. Y'all all right? Come on now. Come on, you got to catch that. You don't have to clean up to come to church. You got to come to Jesus to get cleaned up. You see, that be, look, we know what love is not because we loved God, but because God loved us. And look at what he did. He sacrificed for us. When I say that you cannot lead those that you do not love, this is what I'm talking about. Because when you try to lead people you do not love, you do not sacrifice for them you sacrifice them. Because when you lead people you don't love, you actually manipulate them. And you actually use them for your own gain and your own improvement. And that's not at all what Jesus did. That's not, you want to define love? Look at Jesus. Tell you a story. It's going to take me a couple stories to get to the story, so stay with me, all right? Everybody okay? i got to tell some stories to get to the story. Uh, I, I was born into a, into a uh, pastor's home. I, I'm a fourth-generation firstborn in Hilson to serve in the Wesleyan Church as an ordained minister. For about 100 years, there's been Hilsons in the Wesleyan Church. They can't get rid of us. <laughs> and, um, and so, so um, but after I was, shortly after I was born, my dad decided that he loved women and booze more than he loved my mom and God. And so he took off. And um, mom moved back up to uh, North Carolina. Now, now, I'm going to tell you, my dad, just, just to finish the story, just to close that loop, my dad is now back to the Lord and is serving the Lord. He's saved. He has repented of all those years. And it took 30-some years to get this to happen. But he is now an ordained minister in the Southern Baptist Church. So he has come back to the Lord, okay? So, so, so I w my mom moved back to North Carolina, and she remarried. So I was born into a pastor's home, but I was raised in a carpenter's home because she remarried a man by the name of Greg Goodman, and he was a construction superintendent. And, and so I, I was raised by Greg Goodman. He's the one, by the way, if you hear me use the word daddy, I'm talking about Greg Goodman, okay? Because he, he was my daddy, all right? Paul's my, my father, and Gray's my daddy. Uh, Y'all, anybody that's been and lived in what I've lived, you know what I'm talking about, all right? So at any rate, any rate, so, so daddy, um, he, he, I got to tell you another story. That, that's for two story, third story to get to the story. When I went out, let me tell you, I can explain to you what Greg Goodman's like, and here's how I can do it. I went out to buy my first car, and we went out to the car dealership, and I don't know how Daddy knew the guy, but Daddy knew Charlie Linker, and Charlie was the salesman at the, at the car dealership. I don't really know how they knew each other, but they knew each other. So we went out, and I was going to buy my first car. I picked one out. It was a 1970-something um, Toyota Celica hatchback. For those of you who are old enough, it was the one that looked like a pregnant dog tick. And it was tan colored, so it looked exactly like a big, fat, pregnant dog tick, all right? So uh, at any rate, I liked the car, and I wanted to buy it. And so Daddy told Charlie, he said, Charlie, that's the one the boy likes. We, I think we'll take that one. And Charlie said, you know what, Greg? It's later in the day. Why don't you and the boy just go and take the car home? You come back tomorrow. We'll fill out all the paperwork. Daddy said, well, Charlie, I need to give you some money or sign something. He said, you know, and, and I'll never, I will never forget this as long as I live. Charlie Linker said, Greg Goodman, listen to me. He said, I wish you owed me a million dollars. Because if you did, I know I'd see every penny of it in this lifetime. Now you take that boy in his car home. We'll sign papers tomorrow. You see that? That's how my daddy was known. 
He was always honest. He, look, look, look. I heard, I heard the funniest thing on the radio the other day, but it works. It works. I'm going to put it here. If my daddy told you that a chicken was dipping snuff, you better look for a can up under his wing. <laughs> Isn't that a great line? I love that line. Anyway, I don't dip snuff. It's nasty. But anyway, um, so, 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 so my dad was very honest. Okay, there's all the stories. Now I can tell the story. All right, now I can tell the story. When I, was, uh, when I was younger, we went for a while to an independent church. I'm not fond of independent churches, by the way. There's, not, there's nothing wrong with them per se. But, but the problem with an independent church, the problem with this independent church, was the pastor owned everything. He owned the property. He owned the building. He owned the sound system. He owned the microphones. He owned the pews. That's messed up. I'm just here to tell you, I'm in a denomination today because that's messed up. No pastor should own everything. Because if it's his, it's not God's. I have issues with that. Some of y'all might disagree with me. That's all right. You don't have to agree with me. You just have to love me. That's the whole sermon. I don't like this preacher. Anyway. So, so, so anyway, we started going to this church. And it was, you know, it was fun. It, it, they, had it, they had it really going on. And, and we enjoyed it. And we served there for many, many years. Well, there came a moment where my dad was helping him with a, um, with a building project. And he went down to the building supply place and they said, Gray, the, the guy down there said, Gray, I'll, I'll give you anything that you'll sign for personally. But your preacher's not paying his bills, so I'm not going to give you anything for him. So daddy went back, was trying to figure out what's going on, and he went into a board meeting. And he said, he said, preacher, the, the, the folks down at the supply store say that we're not paying the bills. And that preacher got mad and defensive, and he looked at my daddy, and he said, you're a liar. You, know, you got to understand, daddy was never one given, the one that was given to a lot of emotion at all. So he didn't overreact. He didn't yell out. I don't think I ever heard the man yell my entire life. And listen, I earned some yelling but he never yelled. And so he just said, well, okay. And he left. And we quit that church. Now, 30 years later, I can tell you a few things. I can tell you that it's been proven that the man was not paying his bills. And they barely finished the church. I can also tell you 30 years later that the truth of that man's dishonesty is well known in the entire community and they never filled up that church they finally built you know why i'm putting this story here because when you don't love like jesus you'll use people to try to get what you want instead of adding value to people and showing grace to people the way christ said to do so now, it would have been okay if the preacher said, you know what, we're out of money, Gray, I, it's true, I'm, I'm sorry. That would have been a whole different story. Forgive me, let's move on. But instead, instead, watch, watch, instead of protecting the flock God gave him, he was protecting the bank account he thought was his. No, 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 everybody listen to me. I'm picking on preachers, but I'm talking to you. Because we've got to love people above all else. We've got to treat people right. Y'all, can I tell you something about my, my dad? I believe that he's in heaven today. He passed away a couple years ago. I believe he's in heaven today. But he never set foot back in a church unless I was the one that happened to be preaching. He never trusted pastors again. I need you to hear me. I wear that mantle heavily as a pastor. But I need you to wear it just as heavily as a follower of Christ. It matters. Because when you call the name of Jesus but act like the devil, you drive people away from the only hope they have. And there's nothing loving about that. Love. 
rightly understood, comes from God. Love rightly expressed identifies God's people. Love rightly defined is found in Jesus. But then he finishes up with verse 12. Look at verse 12. No one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us. And his love is made complete in us. You hear that? Some of you are going, what's that mean? Let me show you. Love, rightly lived out, reveals God. Can I tell you a story of another preacher? Let's go back to the story of Grandpa Freeman. Grandpa Freeman was a preacher his entire life as well. But Grandpa Freeman was a preacher that knew how to love people. I remember years, uh, years ago, I was in college still, and I brought my roommates with me, and, um, and, and we went over it. I, I forget why. I, I think I just hadn't seen Grandpa and Grandma in a while, and I thought we needed to visit. So I, I brought my roommates with me, and we went to visit. I said, y'all, come on, we're going to go visit my grandpa. And they went, okay. And they were, they were church folks, too. We, we were all in a, in a Christian rock band together. It was interesting. And um, so, uh, so we, we, we showed up, and we sat down, and Grandpa was, Grandpa was one of these, I don't know, southern gentlemen that spoke with a very slow kind of a southern drawl. Michael, how you doing today? You know, and then the conversation would take about four hours. And... Um, <laughs> He'd say, we'd get, we'd get down to the end of a meeting, we'd get down to the end of a visit, and he'd say, Mama, Mama, that's what he called Grandma, Mama, go get Michael a piece of money. I don't want him leaving out of here without a piece of money. Well, that, that meant a $20 bill, and I was in college, y'all. Come on now, that was important. <laughs> and so uh, he said, he, we were sitting there, and he said, he said, boys, before you boys leave, let me pray for you. And I went, oh, here it comes. See, my buddies didn't know. So we all stood up. And Grandpa commenced to pray. And I'm going to tell you, the floor of heaven dropped out. And we stood in Grandpa's living room that day with him talking to his friend, God. And I've never been in a church service any sweeter. I've never been in a worship service any more powerful than that moment. He prayed and heaven fell. And he prayed over every one of us. The man could hardly move at this point. But he prayed over us and heaven just kept falling. And finally he said, amen. He reached out and hugged us. You boys be careful now. We got out the door, and the door closed behind us, and my friends went, wow. <laughs> they, they looked at me, and they said, does that always happen? I said, you ought to hear him pray over the food. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Grandpa could pray. He knew how to love people, and he knew how to love his God. I'm telling you there was a red phone in that man's house. After he died, I went looking for it. The phone that when he picked it up, God went, Robert, what can I do for you? You know what I mean? I mean, look, 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 look. It was awesome. And when Grandpa died, I remember the day he died. Because when he died, all the family started coming together. And uh, the day Grandpa died was the day that I did my very first solo funeral as a, as a senior pastor. We had just moved to Sandy Ridge Wesleyan Church. It was literally just months after the account that I just gave you. But that same day, I did my first funeral, and the funeral was a 10-month-old baby girl. And on the day I buried that 10-month-old baby girl, unable to see anything in that casket but my own two-year-old, my mom called. Michael, Grandpa probably won't make it through the night. I said, Mom, I can't come. She said, I know, but we're all here. I said, you tell him I love him, and you tell him I'm praying for him. Now I'll see him on the other side. She said, he knows, but I'll tell him. He died that night. His 
surrounded by his wife, all five of his children that stopped their lives to go stand beside this man. And too many of his grandchildren to fit in the room. I showed up the next day and we began to make plans. And I, 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 to this day, I remember standing in the receiving line. As people walked by us, people that he had pastored 30 years ago. And they would stop and they would say, Michael, you must be Michael. I'd say, yeah, I'm Michael. Your grandpa used to tell me about you. They'd say, let me tell you what Robert did for me. They waited 30 years and drove two hours just to tell us how the love of this one man changed their lives. I'm here to tell you that love rightly lived out reveals God to people. When they see love through your life, when they see you sacrificing for them, not sacrificing them, their lives are changed. And I'm going to tell you something. I'm going to teach you something that you need to learn. When you do that for people, they will stand by you every moment. You do that for people in your family, and they'll cancel their lives to stand next to your bed as you make the journey home. You do that for people in your business and they will, they will make sure that they defend you. You do that for people on your team at work. And you will never lack for people that will work hard as long as it's for you. You want to know how to lead? Love. You want to know how to have a marriage? Love. You want to know how to parent? Love. You want to know how to live? Love. Because I got the best advice you'll ever get. When you get up there, you love them people. And you take care of them people. And they will love and take care of you. Pastor, pray for us.